Alliances, in theory, sound like a fantastic idea. I have a bunch of weapons. You have a bunch of weapons. So here's an easy win. We combine all of our weapons together to coerce a common enemy. It's like chocolate and peanut butter joining forces to eradicate Brussels sprouts. However, there are two slight problems with this, both of which are currently on display in U.S. presidential politics, and therefore, for better or worse, are something that the entire world is forced to care about. First is the immediate problem you encounter once in a crisis, and was a chronic concern during the Cold War. You have to trust that your partner will follow through on its commitments when push comes to shove. This is the alliance abandonment problem, and we have covered classic solutions to it before, so I will not discuss it again today. The second is a long-term problem with those armaments. You see, all of those armaments we have today, well, they're great. However, we built them before constructing our alliance. Thus, I produced an amount of weapons anticipating that I would have to defend myself. But hey, we're friends now. Therefore, I do not need as many guns and bombs now that I can rely on yours. Of course, I am not about to destroy all of the stockpiles that I own. But, you know, those guns and bombs will not last forever on the shelf. Tritium, for example, has a half-life of 12 years and is not exactly cheap to produce. This reactor is one of the only places that does it. However, unless I keep cycling out the tritium, all of my boosted nuclear weapons will stop working. Other weapons might still work in the broadest sense. It is just that my opponents will be producing newer technologies that will eventually invalidate everything that I own. And unless I also invest in research and development, I too will fall behind. Fortunately, I have you, my new alliance partner. So I let my armaments fall into a state of disrepair, and with all of the money that I have saved, I can give you this nice basketball. Hey, no complaining. It's a fair trade. Now, it is not like I'm going to stop building and maintaining everything, but some things are just very expensive, and I'd rather spend my money elsewhere. I bet you can see the problem here. You have the exact same incentives in this alliance. As a result, ten years later, the merger of our top two militaries has turned into a partnership of second-rate has-beens. This issue is known as the Free Rider problem, and if you have been paying attention to NATO politics over the last decade, you know all about it. In 2014, Russia annexed Crimea, sending a shockwave through the rest of Europe. A new sense of urgency swept over NATO. At the annual summit that year, the NATO heads of state dusted off a conversation that dated back to the Bush administration and agreed to the 2% rule, or more precisely, rule. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, hmm, this sounds like an agreement that unequivocally states that 2% is the superior form of milk, and that skim milk is water that's lying about being milk. But actually, it is the rule that says that all NATO members should spend at least 2% of GDP on defense. The idea being here that, in light of what was happening in Ukraine, the contemporary levels of spending were insufficient to keep Russia at bay. Think of it as a line in the sand. Above 2%, you are pulling your weight. Below 2%, well, you are free riding. Being down here might give you more money for your local parks and recreation services, but it might not be so hot for national defense. For perspective, Russia right now is spending 6% of GDP in the midst of a war. Now, how exactly one calculates that spending is complicated. Seriously, take a look at the simplified version that NATO provides on its website. Huh, they missed an and there. Now, you would think I would be done at this point, but unfortunately, you would be wrong. Whew. That was about three minutes of real time loss. I might need a breather here. In any case, the basic idea is that you are spending the money at home, not contributing to some sort of NATO slush fund. Fun with accounting aside, 
At most, only four countries were hitting the mark back in 2014. The United States, the United Kingdom, Greece, and Estonia. Needless to say, most countries were not going to hit the 2% threshold overnight. And indeed, NATO had a 10-year ramp-up period built in because of that. Now, Donald Trump seems like the first U.S. president to make a major issue of it. But part of that is a function of how Obama, who oversaw the development of the 2% target, could do little to get everyone across the goal line, because he was heading out of office by the time the defense ministries had to make the corresponding allocations. That made Trump the first president able to criticize NATO countries for failing to put themselves into position to meet the standard. And boy did he. The theme of undershooting the target would continue. In 2022, even with the war in Ukraine ongoing, only Lithuania, Poland, and Latvia joined the other four in the 2% club. To be fair, some defense priorities were shaped at the start of the year, before Russia's invasion began. But even then, the lack of a speedy correction is startling. And the consequences of this have been directly observable on the battlefield. Had NATO allies pressed ahead to the 2% threshold back in 2014, Europe's warehouses would have been full of weapons and ammunition to donate to Ukraine. Perhaps more importantly, the arms infrastructure that rotted following the end of the Cold War would have been rebuilt, meaning that NATO could have continued the flow of weapons to Ukraine over the course of a long war. It is even possible that the Kremlin, having observed Europe's better preparation, would have been deterred from invading Ukraine at all. On the other hand, the tide is starting to turn. 18 countries are projected to exceed 2% in 2024. In some ways, it is remarkable that more than half of NATO's 32 countries are meeting the goal, given the free-riding incentive. But that still raises the question of how to get the other 14 countries across the finish line. Okay, maybe 13 because Iceland doesn't actually have a standing army. By the way, props on the nail polish to match the flag. And speaking of hands that I guarantee are not a problem, that takes us to a recent idea for a solution from Trump. If the concern is that states are not spending up to the standard to provide for the common defense, then why not exclude them from that common defense? After all, if you are a member of a gym and you do not pay your dues, then they simply do not let you into the gym. Or, in Trump's words, he would encourage Russia to do whatever the hell they want to delinquent countries. Now, to be clear, for practical purposes, that would hardly seem to have any bite in the current situation. All but one NATO country that share a border with Russia, that is, the places that Russia would be likely to invade, is above 2%. The lone holdout is Norway, which has a tiny Arctic border, and will soon be at 2% anyway. Still, abandonment would represent a significant change in NATO policy. Previously, I described the 2% rule as a rule. That is because NATO has not agreed to any sort of punishment for countries under the threshold. Consequently, 2% is less a rule and more a rule of thumb. Or to use NATO's own terminology, it is a guideline. Nevertheless, on the surface, Trump's proposal would appear to provide a way to counteract the free-riding incentive. Collective defense does not seem like other types of public goods, like low-carbon emissions. If Spain recklessly pumps CO2 into the air, France cannot punish it by denying Spain the low CO2 air that France works hard to maintain. That is because air circulates worldwide. We either have low global CO2 emissions, or we do not. Countries are not going to be selectively impacted based on their own emissions. In contrast, it does seem like you could deny collective defense, like the earlier example of entry into a gym. In fact, it is even built into the Article 5 provision on the subject, which does not specify exactly how members are to respond to an attack on one of their own. Rather, it just instructs the states to do what they think is necessary, and then have a meeting to consider it. Now, think about what that means. 
if Finland were to take advantage of its newfound NATO insurance policy and cut all of its defense spending, and then Russia were to invade, NATO countries could, in theory, decide to not do anything in response beyond offering some thoughts and prayers. Good luck. The problem, though, is that collective security is more complicated than that. Let's look at firefighting as an analogy. The vast majority of the world treats it as a public good. Tax revenues fund the firefighter units around your local communities. Anyone can call them, and they will race to the scene to put out any fires that they see. In principle, though, it seems like you could privatize the industry. But to see the problems with doing that, let's head to a place known worldwide for how well everything there functions. Yep, we are going to Washington, D.C. If the Finnish embassy fails to pay its dues and a fire starts there, then firefighters will not respond to the emergency call coming from the embassy to put out the fire. That's what they get for not paying. The problem, though, is that fires are not very respectful to socially constructed property lines. And with the fire not being properly fought, it could spread to the Vatican's embassy, then to the embassy of Norway, and Azerbaijan, and Nepal, and Cabo Verde, and then suddenly the United States Naval Observatory, home of the Vice President, is up in smoke. No. The best place to fight a fire is the place where the fire starts. So, yes, NATO can selectively deny Freeriders the benefits of the service of collective defense. It is just that it is not in the best interest of the collective to do so. At least not when push comes to shove, which is really the only time when it matters. Let's dig deeper into the logic there. NATO could just let Russia attack Finland. The problem, though, is that a Russian success there just moves the next crisis over to Sweden's border. Now, if you want to degrade Russian military capacity, where is the best place to do it? Well, like with fighting a fire, it is easier to start at the original source of the crisis. Here, that is where you have an army of 180,000 highly motivated Finns willing to sacrifice themselves to prevent a Russian takeover. This is especially true when your battle plans have been configured to do so all along, in contrast to, say, what is going on in Ukraine right now, or in Georgia in 2008. That is part of why NATO did not directly intervene in those conflicts. So, yes, NATO can selectively deny Freeriders the benefits of the service. It is just that, once again, it is not in NATO's own best interest to do so. But the reason that Trump's comments caused such a stir back in Brussels was because alliance partners worried that the comments could lead to deterrence failure. The military leadership understands the central problem and recognizes that a collective NATO response is inevitable if Russia were to attack. The last thing that they want is the appearance that it might not be, which might wrongly convince Russia to try an attack, which then leads to a much bigger war. That would be bad for everyone, and could have just been adverted had the messaging not deviated from the standard NATO philosophy. So when Trump raises concerns about allies failing to hit the 2% mark, he's not wrong. It is actually built into NATO's own guidelines. It is just that fixing the problem is not as simple as threatening to withhold assistance. Fun fact, Montenegro has the smallest economy among NATO countries, with a $6.2 billion gross domestic product. But even then, they could pay for about 413 million copies of my books on the Russia-Ukraine war. Check the video description for more information on them. And if you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe and I will see you next time. Take care. By the way, for those of you who caught the Parks and Rec reference from earlier, I hid this image of Amy Poehler's head in the video. Did you spot her? Hashtag where's Leslie in the comments.